Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Walter Hood to you this afternoon. Uh, Walter was a professor, mentor, and friend of mine when I was at UC Berkeley. Um, I've always been inspired by his uh, magnetic combination of design energy and consideration for all populations in a place. I think it's fair to say that Walter opened my eyes to the design potential and importance of everyday spaces like the street corner or the steps outside the laundromat. These are the places where a community is defined and potentially strengthened through design. I'd like to read you a few sentences from a 2005 Metropolis article on Walter. Quote, Hood has insisted that landscape architecture be held accountable for the publicness of the spaces it creates. Rather than any particular aesthetic, he defines his work by the behavior it encourages, or rather, the behavior it doesn't discourage. In a Walter Hood landscape, you're free to be, to loiter, to sleep, to perform, to throw a football, to walk a pit bull. In his 18-year tenure as professor and department chair of landscape architecture at UC Berkeley, Walter has disseminated this important perspective to hundreds, even thousands of students, many of whom have carried his message into teaching jobs themselves. Through his firm Hood Design, Walter has practiced and refined these ideas with several important public street and park projects all over the country. He's well known for his award-winning Lafayette Square Park, Splash Pad Park, both in Oakland, California, and most recently for his work at San Francisco's new de Young Museum, where he collaborated with the Swiss architecture firm Herzog de Meuron. Walter's awards and recognition include winning the Rome Prize in 1996, winning design competitions in Miami and Macon, Georgia, and numerous design awards for his project. He is currently working on an invited MFA with the Art Institute in Chicago, looking at urban sculpture. And uh, in 2004, the mayor of Oakland, California, declared April 24th Walter Hood Day for his, quote, pioneering achievements in urban landscape design. Well, today is Walter Hood Day in Muncie, and we're very pleased to have you here. Please welcome Walter Hood. Meg, where did you find all this stuff? You know? Particularly, I didn't like the 18 years. She's kidding. It's only been nine. Okay. <laughs> this is really loud. How are you guys today? Can you guys hear me up there? You guys must be the first years up there, right? It's really nice to be in Muncie today. Um, my first time in Indiana, and I had um, a chance to go through the studios, and it was really a pleasure to talk to some of you guys. And um, I, I wish you guys all the best of luck in your endeavor, um, and particularly for those studying landscape architecture. It's much more difficult than architecture. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's probably because you have to satisfy everyone, not a few, but everyone. And that's why it's really hard to do. I would say keep the faith. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about some ideas that manifest themselves only after um, a lot of work has been done, and particularly in my practice. And what's really nice about academia, being in a place like this, is you get a chance to reflect. You get a chance to... Uh, think about things in a completely different way. Why? There's no client, there's no budget, and there are people around all your faculty members who have these amazing ideas, and you can think out loud. One of the things that has begun to affect my practice as of late is, can we begin to look at our public spaces, particularly in the U.S., in a different way? has a hundred years of making public landscapes in a particular way, and I use a hundred just for the last century. Have we exhausted the typologies that we've used to make landscapes? Meaning, can we begin to envision our public landscapes in a completely different way? Are we still going to be making parks in 250, 2050? Are we still going to be making streets in the same way? We're talking about energy issues. We're talking about multicultural issues. We're talking a lot of sustainable issues. Are these sustainable typologies? And I would argue that probably at the end of the 19th century, the use of the park and the city as a landscape is completely different than it is today. And I think our challenges are really broad today. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that. 
how we can begin to break down those barriers. And one of the first things, closer, and it goes down. Okay, can you cut it down? Does it seem loud to you guys? This seems loud to me, okay. It's like I got a voice inside my head. Um, <laughs> so one of these, um, I guess, strategies for me has been to open things up versus closing things down. To me, the typology closes things down. It has created a bureaucracy that's closed and instead of institutions that are closed. And what happens when we open things up? What happens when we see neighborhoods that are open versus neighborhoods that are closed? And I'd like to sort of talk about these ideas through some case study projects. This is a project in my neighborhood. It's a typical sort of urban neighborhood, um, turn of the century, this new century. That's a school in the middle. The school is a high school. It's one of the worst high schools in Oakland, California. Fifty years ago, it was the best high school in Oakland, California. Here's the campus. Today, no one's allowed in it but the students. Fifty years ago, the community could walk into this place. Today, there are armed guards all the way around and razor wire around. I got involved in a project with a youth, a nonprofit uh, organization that wanted to work with the high school kids that go to this school here. And their first thought was, let's get the students to go outside of the campus and design this little mini park right here on the corner. And so I went out to this mini park with the council person, the principal, UC Berkeley people and all this, and they were trying to get the high school students to reimagine this little corner park. And the elephant in the room to me was this thing. It's like, how can you reimagine that corner park? And you have 10 acres right next to it that these kids were locked in every day. And so I immediately said, well, what if we tore down that fence on the other side and actually made the tennis courts part of this corner? And they went, that's interesting. And so we started looking at the history and understanding the place, and it turns out that that guy number six, Bill Russell, went here, and other people from the uh, Oakland Raiders went here. And so they were able to tap them to help improve the school, while meanwhile, we decided to tear the fence down. Now, this was six years ago. We had an idea that you tear the fence down, this little corner park becomes part of the school, it becomes a walkway through the school, sophomores, freshmen come in, they plant a tree, they make an alley, before you know it, I live two blocks from here. I'll get a chance to use the pool and the track field and I'd get to know the high school students. The fence is still here. Why? Because the city, is one bureaucracy and the school board is another bureaucracy and they don't like each other. And so who's losing? The neighborhood and the kids. But just opening things up. To date, it's really hard to open things up. But we just met last Friday and we're trying it one more time. And this time we're trying to do it. We just met um, a guy who's going to teach tennis lessons. And so over the weekend, we actually made a little opening in the fence and he's going to teach tennis lessons and hopefully the tennis course will slowly erode away. This next project is about 10 miles from that project and it's located in East Oakland. The little ginkgo leaf figure ground up there is the project that we're talking about. And it's Sobrantes Park. It's a first rink suburb of Oakland. It's one of the first communities that blacks were allowed inside the city to move into a suburban neighborhood, and this would be like late 60s, early 70s. It's an amazing community, because when it was first designed, there were nothing but horse riding stables and agricultural fields. Now this is in o Oakland, and you think about it, it's completely developed at this point. It looks like this now. But you can imagine that cloverleaf, which is lower, at one time was the only thing there. And people, third generation, is still there. We were hired to come in that little corner park. And I'm showing you all these little parks, right? This little corner park here with the purple trees. It has a basketball court, a couple of game tables. It was built in the 70s. 
It wasn't part of the original suburb. It was built in the 70s as part of an open space plan where this neighborhood had the smallest percentage of public open space to its residents, percentage-wise. So the city came up with maybe $100,000 and they built this tot lot. This tot lot has become the most notorious basketball court and tot lot. You can find any drug here. People from the suburbs drive to this tot lot to basically buy their drugs. Why? There's one way in and one way out of the community. And so this becomes a great place along the 880 corridor for drug dealers to basically stand here and sell their narcotics to um, people. And we were hired as designers to redesign this thing and make it work. Right? So zooming out, we discovered, again, that there was this 15-acre school which was like five blocks away from that little corner park. And when they were doing the calculations for open space, this was not part of it because schools had literally broken away from park and rec. And so this wasn't a public space, even though kids in this neighborhood were walking to this school and were there all day. So typical analysis, we wanted to show the community how they ended up in this predicament and land use and urban develop meant pretty much did away with the public space. The other thing we did was we went out and we walked with people in this suburb. Now you have to understand, most of these people here had never walked outside of that ginkgo leaf. They drove through it. So immediately, once they begin to see is this community, which is shaped by this flow, they knew nothing of this and this, and this is where all the problems were. And so we got them to go, well, we don't really need this. Let's put this back here, right? We even have a creek. Let's maybe even build a trail, right? And let's refocus our energies on the big public space, and let's begin to tear the walls down between this edge by making this a new gateway that people in the community could use in a completely different way. Now, in Oakland, there's a law that says you can't get rid of public space. You can't get rid of a park. If you get rid of a park, you've got to replace it one to one. And so we were able to find enough space back here <laughs> to argue that you could move this from here to here. And this became a big political battle, and we actually just won and were just awarded the contract to actually move the park. But along the way, we told the residents here that Flora Sobrante, that they have the highest biomass in East Oakland. Because each house, when they were developed, got a plane tree. And the plane tree has lived. And so it's the only community that you'll go in and there's continuous trees down the street in people's yard. They had forgotten about that. So we said, the city will come in and plant another tree. And before you know it, you have this increased biomass, for one. And then we can start thinking about getting rid of the park and doing this. And planting the tree it was just that thing to get people involved and get them going. And once we had them going, we could then begin to think about what this could be. And so the park has been erased. This is the main intersection. And we went through a series of designs, of strategies, just thinking about what this new thing can be. A gateway at once, but also a place where people may become, have a market on Saturdays, but it could become a space that will be constantly changing, constantly transforming itself. This is my favorite, just a wood. Just plant as many trees as possible and make it scary for the little kids. This next project is located in Golden Gate Park. This kind of opening is completely different. If you've ever been to San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, it's not Central Park in New York. I call it like the sister on the West Coast or the brother on the West Coast. Central Park, we know, was designed by Olmsted. This was designed by a park ranger or the manager of the park. Everyone thinks Olmsted designed this. He did. Olmsted wanted there to be a promenade on Venice because of the, the winds were so strong out here in the sand dunes that he thought if you did a promenade on Venice, you'd be protected and it would take you back down to the bay. But instead, a park was built out here, a thousand acre park, 
that was really a way to spur development to the western edge of the city. It's a negative figure cut into the city's uh, morphology. And it's a place where one of my colleagues at Berkeley, Professor Pollard, calls it's uh, a landscape where house plants are like on steroids. Right? I mean, Golden Gate Park, even Northern California, you find things growing like clivia. You know, I'm from the East Coast. This stuff is in your house. This stuff is used as ground cover out here. So plants are just literally planted. And the way they water them, they just shoot jets of water in the air and let things go. And that's the way it's managed. There are stories about people living in this stuff. And when we first started working on this project, every time I would go out to Golden Gate Park, I would get lost over and over and over again because it was kind of like a wild nature. So the project is the New De Young Museum. The architects wanted to create a building that would change the way you see the park. And before the building was built, you could be anywhere in Golden Gate Park. And so the building does that. You can be at certain places in Golden Gate Park, see the New De Young, and go there. And what we tried to do in the landscape was make this landscape, which seems benign at times, much more important when you're at the museum. So the museum has a way to frame an experience that one might get when you leave. Here's the view of that subtracted piece. This has been called an aircraft carrier landing. The architects thought of it more as a way to sort of blend this green back into the concourse. It's, if you haven't been here, it's a copper cladded building on five facades. The copper is punched. It is punched concave, convex. There are holes sometimes. And then it's uh, sometimes just all cuttings. But the idea was to create this new filigree. This will go green at some point. That will literally reflect uh, the landscape. The history of this landscape, this is all on Phil right now, there's a parking garage underneath here. The Asian Museum used to sit here, and this used to be a parking lot. So all the landscape, the 15 acres of landscape, actually were all built before. And the idea was very simple. Through the collaboration, the architects created a tripartite scheme where there's three bars, one, two, three. The front part would be public. The back part would be private. The landscape comes in from the back and the art experience comes in from the front. And the idea is that, again, as a public institution, anyone can come through the museum and experience the building and landscape without buying a ticket, which is a pretty interesting thing today, you know, when there's the big museum ecologists talk about it. And the idea with the landscape is, can you push up against the building so that the back becomes part of the park, and these new, two new pieces become part of the park experience? And here's that view. You see the front opening up here. A new garden to the right, a new garden to the left. This is a sculpture garden. These are both donor gardens. These were given to the city uh, by individuals. And this is part of that concourse front. The landscape along the front, we recognize that it's all podium. You arrive underground in the garage here. So this is all on structure. There are 30 historic palm trees where we found pictures of all of these palms that were planted. They were about this high. The museum spent over a million dollars to move those palms about a mile away. We took care of them, gave them haircuts, and brought them back. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, there was historic sculpture. This was the historic front of the museum at one point in time. These are the palm trees being brought back. And again, Having 110-year-old palm trees in front of a new building does something. And this is the power of landscape that we forget, right? That we're constantly erasing, right? And this notion of the palimpsest, the palimpsest doesn't only exist here, but it's three-dimensional. And you'd be surprised how many people asked us, where did you get those palm trees? You know, they've been here for the last 100 years, but most people never saw them because of just the way they were placed. But the new landscape rises up from Tea Garden, and it provides this new ground for people to understand where they are. If you dig down 30 inches in this grass, you'll actually find sand. This is a giant sand dune that was created. 
So everything we tried to interpret as you move through was to get the eye to move down to the ground, thinking about the materials and reshaping the experience of what it is to move through the park. All the landscapes you see in context is just the borrowed scenery that we push to certain things so that the park again comes closer. The landscape gets very calm when it gets next to the building and we chose to use different types of site objects to begin to create a conversation. Sometimes through the native grass the history is recalled, but it's also through the materials that is being made where you ride your bike through a grassland. And one of the things that I enjoyed getting the client to think about is how can we infuse the public realm, you know, in a place like San Francisco with a quality that you only see in like a European community. Landscapes should not be $7 a square foot in the public realm, right? I mean, we default back to concrete or sidewalk or asphalt paving. These are asphalt pavers and this is stone, sometimes a meter in size. This is all public space. And so this idea that our public realm can actually have detail is not something that we can only dream of, but something that we should advocate. You know, that we've dumbed down our public realm to being the most least expensive elements. Why? Because someone says they're harder to maintain, et cetera, et cetera. When, when the, the park guy first saw this detail, his first thing was, that's going to be a bitch to maintain. And I said, it's a mow curb, man. This is for you. Put the mower here and run it along the edge. <laughs> but providing that variety on the ground, um, you'd be surprised how people are prompted to react in a different way. And artists might react completely different. This is Andy Goldsworthy, his piece. He was prompted to do something because of the paving we used. We used an Appleton Green Moor paving which is from his local quarry in Scotland. And so he was prompted then to crack the stone as an installation piece. So he sat there and he cracked all the stone that we put in to create a piece. Part of the other half of the building, the experience of art on the inside, the landscape becomes art object. Eucalyptus trees fill one of the courts. And it fills the courts because as part of the narrative and the idea, eucalyptus trees are part of the cultural landscape in California. Eucalyptus trees are hated trees today. They're banned from most cities. Why? Because they're a fire hazard and they drop their, their refuse on the ground. I love eucalyptus trees. Every project I get, I find a way to bring them back. But one day, these will be the last eucalyptus trees in Golden Gate Park because they're taking them all out. And so again, the way we can begin to position landscape. The fern courts, the architects bring us down to the basement and take us back up. Two blocks away is an exotic fern grove that was given to the park uh, by a family who wanted to give them exotic ferns. Most people think these ferns are native, but they're Australian tea ferns, tree ferns. And they're two blocks away, so we chose to bring them inside again and showcase them. And since this has been designed, now everyone makes the connection between these tree ferns and the ones five blocks away. And they're always asking me, did you take those ferns and put them in there? No, we have to buy our own. I would love to do that. But this idea, again, of making people aware of their environment. And this is an open courtyard to the sky, so during the winter now, it actually drains the entire building. So inside of uh, the fern planting is a drainage area that only goes green, it goes deeper green in the winter and gets really dry in the summer. And as it moves out, it becomes part of the dialogue into a children's garden. And the simple idea here is, this is for a donor who wanted a place for kids, and I had never done a children's garden until I started noticing what kids do at museums. And this garden is meant for kids to come in run the circuit, and they do this. They do that, 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 and then they go to sleep. And then that's the perfect example. And parents are happy. But it's an experience where it wasn't about apparatuses, but more about the qualities of landscape. 
and ways in which we could get people young and old to begin to think about the building as well as the ground plane and the landscape. So there are things like menageries that one day will become these big green shapes that have sculpture in them that are part of the interior collection or a walkway that at times make sound but also fogs over and lights up. This is all open to the public 24 hours a day. And then at certain times of the day, phenomena starts to happen. And one of the ideas, and this happened as we were designing, when I first started going to this landscape, going from Oakland to San Francisco. Oakland has like one of the highest percentages of sunny days in the country, and San Francisco probably is at the other end. And one thing is that we noticed that we were acclimated in less than four months. That after about four months, I'd go over there in a short sleeve shirt. You forget where you are. And so the fog actually reminds people where they are. Because you actually forget the fog. And I remember being here one day, this guy from Australia or somewhere was like, these San Franciscans are really crazy. They, they have fog, they just make more of it. You know, but this idea to immerse people in an experience, and now people actually wait on the hour for the fog. And there's actually a blog up now on the fog. The sculpture garden makes a connection with the Japanese tea garden, which at one time the Asian museum set here. So this is a landscape that has always blocked this other landscape. And so we were able to find vegetation that was just as old as the Japanese tea garden through the nursery. And we reused it to make this shift. So these trees here are the same age as some of the trees in here. And so it feels like they were all done at one time. But what it does is begin to, again, blur that landscape. And a very simple circuit provides a place to experience sculpture. The obligatory cloths. Uh, this is a John Wong, which is a stainless steel piece. This is all part of the park. Our landscape stops right here. But here, this feels like it's part of the same, with the green more underneath the canopy. And this is looking out of the top gallery. And you can see JFK Drive is here, but the park becoming part of this one movement. And then at certain places, the architecture sits back, and the landscape is allowed to sort of rise up through the section. And seasonally, it's remarkable how this entire park goes through a transformation through the garden, not from outside. But being inside this new place, people are able to see the changes in the park in a completely different way. And as you go along the perimeter, this is the old Asian wall. The geometry was really different than the new geometry, so that's spotlighted. And then you go down into James Terrell's Three Gems, which was actually commissioned. We were 60% into CD drawings. And Terrell came out to the site. And if you know James Terrell's work, he immediately, well, after he couldn't do his thing in the building, he immediately came out to the landscape and he went for the hill. And so we basically turned the hill around and put a hole in it. And that's where his sky space is. And then up to the roof from the tower, the architects make a fifth skin so that you can actually experience this landscape that's at eye level uh, from the ground. This next project is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is a story of a, a performing arts center located here in Jackson, and a ski resort here, and a small park. And I was hired to do a garden or a space for the Performing Arts uh, Center. And they wanted a place that people could come out and dance and you know, do things that you do in a performing arts building. But the problem was, this was a public park. And so the idea of doing all of these things within the park, they had never thought of oh, that the bureaucracy wouldn't let them do it. So we met with Park and Rec. And we're sitting there talking about all this great stuff that you do in Performing Arts Center. And you can sort of see the bubble over the guy's head with like picnic table, basketball court, you know. None of these things compute, right? So we had to go around the community. And I did an inventory of the types of parks they had here. And sure enough, they were all the parks with the picnic tables, the basketball courts. 
And we made an argument that downtown Jackson didn't have any public gardens. And I made this big fuss about gardens. This could be this amazing garden. You got a square downtown with the antlers, and now if you get a garden, people will come. And they bought it. And so just changing the nomenclature allowed us to design this thing in a completely different way. And that's a lesson, right? That if you get a project in public practice or even in school, one of your faculty members go, this project is a park. Challenge them. Why is it a park? Why did they make it a park versus a wood, versus a meadow, versus some other thing? Because sometimes the parkness gets in the way. And I'll give you an example. This is our design for the Performing Arts Center. And the design came out of the way people moved historically on this space. I was inspired by John McPhee and glaciers, just to make a long story short. This is a glaciated plain coming through here. But the thing that turned me on the most was I couldn't imagine making a landscape powerful enough to compete with that existing landscape. That everything I would do there would just be so small in scale. So what we decided to do through a series of models is we remade the ground plane. And the ground plane is made through all indigenous material within five miles. So if you dig down here in Jackson, there's cobble rock, which is left over. There's also erratics. There's all this beautiful stone that the local architects and landscape architects know. And so through this, we were able to make a new set of spaces that could work with the Performing Arts Center as well as work with the single individual space. There are things like restrooms and bus stops that become these kind of erratic-like forms. And then we design the rest of the space in section. So this is the material, as you can see, and the sectional display as it relates to the hill behind. And most of the design was designed in the section because we knew that you'd be looking up at this thing the entire time while you were in this place. So the section changes as you move through it. This next project is in Dade County, and it's a remarkable story um, about segregation, but it's also a remarkable story about people remembering segregation in a completely different way. Virginia Key Beach was a colored beach, or Negro beach, during segregation. It's because blacks couldn't go to South Beach. I mean, this is something we know in the South and Jim Crow South. The city fathers gave the black community a spit of land called Virginia Key. And at the time, Virginia Key wasn't connected, so you had to take a boat out to it. So daily, the brothers and sisters had to get on the boat for about an hour, go out, and they would stay all day. And if you got hurt, the great stories of people getting hurt, home remedies, you had to just wait on the boats to come back. Over time, desegregation, blacks could go to South Beach. Everybody forgot about Virginia Key Beach. Um, they built these rich enclaves out. I think Lucille Ball lives out there, and you know. And then they built a sewage treatment plant on Virginia Key. In the 80s, the beach had fallen fallow. It had completely been eroded, and this developer caught sight of Virginia Key Beach, and he started, you know, asking about it, and he wanted to develop it. And some of the fathers, founding fathers, older blacks in the community remembered, hold on, this was a Negro beach. So they actually found the charter, went to the mayor and said, there's no way you can develop this. This is a Negro beach. And this is in like 1989, right? And so that charter held, and they were able then to get $32 million to build a new museum site for this beach. Um, and through that memory, they did a competition and the competition I worked with Huff and Gooden out of Charleston, South Carolina, to develop a, a design for the new Virginia Key Beach Museum and landscape that talks about this history. Uh, and we won the competition, and now we're just beginning design. The design of this, the landscape particularly, I was really blown away with these stories, right, of, of the history of how people went there. But more importantly, People always reference the landscape when they talk about their experience. And this, for designers, we have to listen, right? People would say, well, we used to meet in the hammock 
And I thought they were talking about the hammock. They were talking about the hardwood hammock. We would be in the mangroves. Oh, we always barbecued near the mangroves. Or we'd be in the dunes. And so as I started doing the research, if you look at a coastal landscape, it's made up of scrans. Right? And these scrans are these localized landscapes. Dunes, uh, mangroves, hardwood hammocks. And they extend for miles along the shoreline. And so people going to a beach or experiencing that nature, they go through these thresholds. And they're powerful. The mangroves are powerful scrans. They're almost like DNA. And so we took this idea of people's memory with the scrans to build a new landscape ecology that was functional, but also memorable to people. So that coming back, they could go the mangroves. They would go the dunes. And it seems like a dumb idea. But it's dumb enough to give you ways to work, right? which is to make a plan. And so these strands literally become part of architecture and part of landscape, of rebuilding this landscape. And the dunes and everything gets over-exaggerated. And the building fits up because you're in the zone. And the, the mangroves become rooms. They become places in which people can inhabit and viewing back towards the ocean, the landscapes become a way to interface with a past as well as a present. So those talk about opening things up, right? Opening, right? Blurring boundaries. Every project you get, you should always propose something outside of your boundary. You should never stay in the line. Always jump out, right? The other thing is, just a short moment, defensible space. And this only comes up because I stopped doing housing projects. I was working with a lot of architects on housing projects. And it occurred to me that the landscapes are no better than the architecture. That if I work, if there's bad architecture, I can't save it. Right? The parsley around the pig, it's still a pig, right? Um, and this idea, you know, for me that I had to stop doing the work to be more critical of it. And one of the things I'm still shaping an opinion about, because I was educated in architecture school uh, using Oscar Newman's defensible space, right? This idea that, you know, these new communities, this used to be one big city block of housing that you could just go in and get lost. Now, you got a cul-de-sac. Now, this little public space belongs to this group of people. This belongs to this group of people. And what it, defensible space, the concept, is we're defending, right? And I pause to wonder, who are we defending against? Right? I mean, what's outside that we don't like? It used to be that we could make one of these things, right? And everybody would come to it. You know? Now, since this project has been done, this thing is dead. No one goes here. This is where the Panthers used to hold their rallies. This is where uh, Sly and the Family Stone used to come and play on Saturdays. Right? No more. Right? Because everybody's got their own little thing here, defending themselves. And we know who they're defending themselves from. Right? So I stopped doing projects. This is one that I, I stopped working on. Housing all the way around. Actually, Mike Piatek is coming to speak. So he might talk about this. But this is the project that did it for me. Mike had nothing to do with it. Mike, Mike's piece is actually here, so he was actually the best. But Five Acre Park, we move to create this new center to a community. All the architects, courtyard side of building, courtyard side of building, courtyard side of building, courtyard side of building. None of them front onto this thing. Everybody has their own separate space. Hot lots, own separate space. Who's going to take care of this? Nobody. Studies show you got small kids, kids are going to be in the tot lot here. Who's going to be out here? The people you don't want. And I guarantee you, they will take over. And so, this idea, I think we have to change the dynamics of public space. If we're doing infill, and every time we do an infill, we have to provide our own public space, what does that say about the public space that's already out there? Right? And it's really saying, we don't really care about those people who have to use that space. We have our own. 
And I live in a gated community in West Oakland. And I notice my behavior. I don't use the park on the corner. Why? Because I have a courtyard. I don't need to go down to the corner. But a lot of people do. But they're the other people. Project that might highlight this a little more, Baldwin Hills. Who's been to Los Angeles? Anybody been to Los Angeles? Who's been on the 405? The 5. Okay. How many people know Baldwin Hills as an architectural project? Okay. This is not Baldwin Hills, the architectural project. This is Baldwin Hills, the landscape. Most people don't know about it. It's that denuded landscape in between the 405 and LAX. It's a couple of synclines, two big hills that pop up out of the landscape that literally are providing oil preserves, that are oil preserves for about eight families. We were hired by a nonprofit along with Mia Lair to do a new 1,500 acre park. This would be the, one of the largest parks in America that would become a new public space for the LA basin. If you're in LA now, there is no big parks in the flats. Everything is up on the hills. And the critique is, we know who lives on the hills, and we know who lives in the flats. And so this could remedy this kind of equity that's needed. 1.1 acres within three miles, one acres within five miles. So just looking at what Baldwin Hills, that deficiency in relationship to other places, began to create a need. We also know that LA is about roads. Everybody drives in LA. It's also about movies. Right? And I show this for a reason. The nonprofit wanted to make a wilderness area. And I'm going, wilderness? What's a wilderness? And it turns out that Baldwin Hills already is a wilderness. The movie, if you go to the, out at Baldwin Hills at night, the most movie production is going on. All of these films were filmed in Baldwin Hills. It's those spooky, scary, shoot 'em up places that you know are somewhere in LA, and it's Baldwin Hills. At the end of LA Confidential and the motel shooting thing, Baldwin Hills. Eddie Murphy, the dirt on the hill and following the dirt and the horses, Baldwin Hills. Um, and people know that. It's this big landscape that has nothing in it. It's industrial. Its location is central. It's very close to everything. But it looks like a big denuded golf course. You see it here. Yeah. Now I'm just going to be very brief here. Here's the big issue here. La Cienega. Here is Baldwin Hills, the beautiful architectural gym. That I actually found out. This Baldwin Hills area is the, used to be the black affluent area. In the, like when Magic Johnson signed his contract, he moved to Baldwin Hills. That was everybody was talking about. So if you're black, you moved over here. If you're white, nine times out of ten, you're over here. If you go to Culver City, over here, most of the brothers are over here. Bologna Creek comes along here, doesn't discriminate, goes through both. And the, biggest, the big idea that the nonprofit wanted to do was to have people over here in South Central be able to have connection back across without crossing a major road. It also would be beneficial for the animals, little bunny rabbits, squirrels, to move across here. But immediately, when you go to the community, we found out that this road was once proposed to go through, stopped. This road was once proposed to go through, stopped. It's very segregated. Why? Because we don't want you over here. right? And so could the park be this way to begin to connect the two? We came up with two basic schemes. One was to do a series of land bridges that connect, and then one to do a tunnel. The land bridges would just connect surface. You would still have the streets. And the tunnel, I tried to get a half mile. We ended up with a quarter mile that would literally allow this one contiguous area. And when I proposed this, most people in, in LA just said, no way. You can't do a tunnel. So, And I'm not heralding my own, uh, blowing my own horn, but Coming from the North Bay, I thought this was very conservative. Everybody thought this was the only thing that people would go for, and I wanted the tunnel, because I had seen some movie, Looney Tunes or something, go in a tunnel and become cartoons on the other side. But this idea that you could like leave the city and come out anew on the other side. 
So we go to this meeting. We were having these huge meetings in LA. And we go to this meeting, and Senator Murray, uh, the senator from the area, saw this plan. And he said, I can sell that. And so he saw something in this plan that he was able to do. Now, this is all privately owned, most of this. When the lights went out in California a few years ago, Baldwin Hills, this idea for a park, was ingrained in people's minds. It's not a park. It doesn't exist. It's private. But when the lights went out, people rallied around the idea, <laughs> went to Sacramento, and stopped the construction of this place, and they were able to get millions, I think like 30 millions, to start the Baldwin Hills Conservancy, which this past fall broke grounds on a first phase piece. So this idea of getting people to think large right, became part of a collective consciousness, and they're actually moving along to do it. And this is the view from Baldwin Hills. It's one of the most fantastic places to go. This notion of the hybrid versus the standardized. I would imagine I could go anywhere, well, maybe to downtown Lincoln and places and find streets, find parks, find other types of landscapes that are just like the landscapes I have in Oakland. You know, I'm sure it's the same furniture, uh, urban, urban forms, forms and surfaces. You know, we become this kind of standardized practice. You get it in an office, you open up, you used to open up suites catalogs, now you just Google it, right? And that, that stuff just comes out. So we don't think about it anymore. And I would challenge you to think about this idea of, again, the institution breaking down. Can we get to a point where we're thinking about things not as individual elements in entities and spaces, but as multiple? And I think this is the sustainable way. We know that. that. To sustain things, we can't keep operating with single use. The more things can do multiple uses, right? If a street can park cars, but also can be a place for a market, can also be a place for skateboarders, can also be a place to infiltrate water, I think it's, it's a better resource. Why do we duplicate things over and over and over again? We're doing, working on a trail for the city of Oakland right now. And the trail suggests that along the waterfront, the waterfront can still be a working waterfront. And there are markers that go up that begin to suggest that it's a trail. But it's more about trying to understand the things that go on along here and only sort of add to it versus erasing. And so we went through and basically recreated sections for 6.6 .6 miles that attempt to marry things that work now with another use. So instead of jogging down a path that's a path for six miles, you're jogging through an experience that's constantly changing. It's changing based on where you are and your relationship inland as well as to the water. Or small parks. This is a small little quarter acre park that we work with um, an urban relief fund to basically make gardens for Head Start students. And we actually built it through a contractor. And so this was looking at new ways of constructing things completely different. So this is a public sidewalk. So the public sidewalk actually gets a bench, gets widened, and has more elements. And along that sidewalk, as it grows, different things happen. Uh, maybe places kids can play with water or drainage back into the earth. Or along the street. This project was done probably 15 years ago where we planted 150 purple leaf plum trees in a double row. And the beautiful thing about this is the housing value along here went up. That people were able, that had lived here for a long time, were actually able to refinance their homes or sell them and retire, right? Or fix things up. Crime was the biggest issue along here and these trees just planting these trees this way deter crime. And I'll tell you how it did. It's no secret. Guys used to hang out right here and sell drugs, right? I mean, right on this corner. When we were done, they were still here selling drugs. But what happened was we did a double row alley of trees. And so we forced people. People used to walk on this side. Now they walk on this side. Drug dealers don't want people walking through the middle of their drug sales. Kind of a dumb, I mean, it's a simple idea. 
But there's enough trees to create that pattern. There's enough trees that get people to go shade sun. Right? The single tree 25 feet on center doesn't do that. Another project, Splash Pad Park, located in downtown Oakland. This is Lake Merritt. This is probably one of the best shopping zones in the city. And we were hired in this instance to basically try to create a, a safer pedestrian realm for people moving from here to here and from here to here. And as you see, there's a road coming through here in a little traffic island, and it's called Splash Pad Park for a reason. You see that little funny shape? These guys who own businesses here at one point in time thought they needed an attraction that people could see from here. So they shot a jet of water up in the air so people could see it, and it splashed down in this pad. Thus, Splash Pad Park. Right? And it only worked for a short time, and then it's, it lay derelict. This is what it looks like today, that same little piece. We closed a road, and we accented the freeway. The freeway is a super elevated, one of the longest spanning sort of uh, overpass. And actually, during construction, it won an award the first year by the California Highway Department. And we moved the thing out so people could see it. But before we designed it, this is what it looked like. It's a place where you just came and crashed. You were welcomed. It was also a place where the city deposited most of its palm trees. And we, we talked to one guy. He said, if you didn't want a palm tree in your yard or in your park, they put it here at Splash Pad. So it had all these palm trees. It also had a commercial zone that historically, the Grand Lake Theater, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, just a lot of different stuff. Right? But the park looked like this. And I swear, I remember going to the movies and thinking, this must have been something that Gary Ekbo designed or uh, Halprin. You know, it was one of those like, landscapes that just looked like people forgot about it. It had bushes all the way around the edges. And um, it was a place that you just park your car and you cut through to go to the commercial zone. A funny thing happened during the RFQ. <laughs> the council person at the time decided that this was a bad space. No one was using it. And we need shopping here. Let's put a Trader Joe's here. And everybody came out of the woodwork and was like, you can't put a Trader Joe's in our park. <laughs> of course, nobody was using the park. But again, this notion of the consciousness of people, they latched onto the park. They defeated Trader Joe's. And they got their council person to put more money in the fund for pedestrian crossing to beautify the area some more. So we got the project. And we decided that we had one goal, to get people to move from one space to the other. But we had to do something about this. It had kakuya grass. It had rodents. We cleaned up the ground plane. We then held a series of meetings. That was probably some of the largest community meetings I've ever had. 130 people showed up the first night. And everybody had different ideas about what this thing could become. So basically, we created a scenario where everybody had their own piece. Some people wanted a park, green. Some people wanted like Times Square Plaza. Some people wanted to unearth the creek. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things. It's only an acre and a half. So I decided to not think about this piece, but to include all of this. And once you start thinking about it as this larger piece, it became really clear that a lot of the issues that people wanted this piece to solve couldn't be solved. Like there was people who wanted a dog park, you know, a place for the dogs to run. We ended up putting them over here. Now, again, this is not our project. Our project is over here. Uh, and a lot of the things that we thought were being crammed here, we were able to find somewhere else within the larger design. But the basic design of Splash Pad runs like this. We took the freeway, and we took the structure, and literally moved it out. We narrowed the street crossings based on that got rid of one lane of traffic, got rid of a through lane here, kept it historically. This is the historic street. And they started having a market here. And the market was done before construction started. So there was a use going on every Saturday before this thing arrived. And this is really important. People were coming here, having a market underneath the freeway. And we worked with them for four years. And so by the time this thing was built, there was already this constituency and a use that was taking place. And it just built on top of that. 
Here it is today. There's Splash Pad Park in that extension going all the way back. And I will say, when I run along the lake today, I do make that connection. People make that connection because it's easier for them. This is what it looks like from the plan. I would say one of the biggest things we did here was not to try to get rid of the freeway. We didn't spend our money trying to get rid of that thing. You can't get rid of it. We actually embraced it, and it's actually gone away. By embracing it, it disappeared. It disappeared because it's just part of a larger set of compositional strategies within the place. It becomes backdrop tunnel. It becomes a place to go through. It becomes a, a legible place through how we change the grades in some area. It becomes a new place. You know, the palm trees are still the same, but the backdrop changes. In certain areas, we kept old sidewalk instead of making everything new, an expanded sidewalk using different materials. But this was almost a way of suturing this landscape back together. So on one hand, it wasn't completely foreign to people when we opened up, but it was completely new on the other hand. We worked with uh, local people to do this project, Name and Lights. They wanted a fountain, so people donated to get their names etched in Ipe, these decks. Uh, and on Saturday, there's a market. And this market has become one of the largest markets in the Bay Area. Every Saturday, I, I, I go like every six months, and every six months, it's way out there. Um, everything from now, they bring slides for kids to jump up and down in, organic back rubs, music. They have a website. I would say go to the Splash Pad website, and you'll see it all. And it's right under a freeway. And we provided small community spaces like gardens and things like that uh, for during the week time when it's dormant, it becomes silent. And it gets noisy on the weekend, and it gets silent. Lafayette Square Park, one of the first projects that we worked for. And, and put simply, this project was designed for a group of people that don't work that spend most of their 24-7 outside hanging out. That's a lot of people in a lot of communities. It might not be people in our community, but in a lot of communities, people use the public realm, and they're out there. They're, they're either disabled, a lot of them retired, you know, or they just have a lot of time on their hands, right? This park was designed with the basic concept that in the 30s, in Oakland downtown, there was a place where men primarily, came to while away the day. There's a Portuguese guy, an Italian guy, a uh, black guy, and Jingle Town. Uh, maybe that's Portuguese. Uh, but this was a diverse place back in the 30s, that people came here and waited for jobs. And it's still that way today. And we wanted it to be a place where that legacy still lives. So any time of the day you could go there, and people are drying their clothes on the hill or using the bathroom. It's the only public facility in the downtown that's open 24 hours a day, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, but it's also a civic space. It's a space that moves out into the public realm. And it has to cater that way. And one of my colleagues, Randy Hester, said something to me during opening day here that I'll never forget, is that these guys look like regular guys. You know, and, and it, that was really profound because what it meant was the proscenium of life, that if I take all of you guys, I take the guy right here, what's your name? I put Mickey and give him a backdrop of a boarded up building with a lot of graffiti, he'd probably scare the hell out of you. But if I also put Mickey up against a backdrop that had some nice flowers, right, some really beautiful things, you look at him and see him different. And that's the basic idea. You know, it's that backdrop, right? If you see, you know, certain people in, diff in the context, that context changes our view of them. And so within the public realm, if there's an equitable distribution, if we start thinking about the public realm in a completely different way, I think we'd react to one another in a completely different way. Make in Georgia a public street that parks 320 cars. And the competition mandate was to keep the 320 cars and we were able to talk about its history, give them a backdrop where this is the daughters of the Confederacy obelisk, you know, the Confederacy. And people, they still dress up 
in those uniforms one day a year, those big ball uniforms. And you know, the Latinos and African Americans in the neighborhood, this is all kind of right? You know, one day a week you see these people in these big gowns and you go like but every day in the public realm you're reminded that you're in a once confederate state. This is a place when we did the competition where they did a blackface routine about me and the, and the mayor. This is in 1998. So, you know, these are places where, you know, identity is still a big issue. But it's also a place where on a hot day, I don't care what color you are, you want some shade. And before there were like maybe 10 trees and now there's over 150 trees. But it's also a place where we talked about it being a yard, a place where people could come together within when you park your car and meet someone. It's also a place where the cotton industry shaped the neighborhood. It's also a place where water wells ran down the middle of the road and people came to get their water. So in the experience of parking your car, you might come across something. You might come across uh, a different way for seeing the landscape, for relating to your neighbor. And this project was just finished a couple of years ago. It took 10 years to build this. Um, Mayor Jim Marshall, who's now a senator, spearheaded the project, and the later mayor, who was their first African-American mayor, pushed this through because he wanted this to sort of work. And lastly, I wanted to talk about this project that we're currently working on with Bette Midler, uh, her foundation in Brooklyn. This is one of the small gardens um, that she started a nonprofit, the New York Restoration Garden, to basically buy up all of the small uh, garden plots that Giuliani was actually going to get rid of throughout the boroughs. And she was able to start this nonprofit, and now she's marrying different designers with different communities and uh, donors. And so we're doing a garden for the G Unit Foundation, which is 50 cents, the wrapper. And so the idea, we decided to sample a classical garden. So this is a sampling of Villangeri, particularly the Gardens of Love. And so this community that's next to uh, um, a train track that comes in, this garden moves out and actually becomes a place for produce, but much more a place for people in the community to actually move out and begin to inhabit. And part of the main piece is these giant cisterns that will collect water that will be used for the garden, but they become the aesthetic uh, that as the train goes by, people will while away the day. And lastly, I, the title of this lecture was Enmeshed Experiences. And this idea of enmeshing our world, of not having to relate always back to the kind of the figure ground, to make a distinction between um, inside, outside, edge, boundary, but to begin to blur those things. I, I really do think that that's where um, our future public spaces will need that kind of energy. That I think societally, we need to, to sort of step out of our little boxes. And it's funny that, you know, I'm talking about this because these ideas are not new. <laughs> these ideas were positive maybe 50 years ago, maybe even longer than that. You know, modernism, right? You know, this idea of getting out of that hermetic box. But how can we begin to think about this in a, as a landscape? And for me, this drawing I did, like, in my sketchbook a year ago, is where we're trying to go in the studio. I challenge you, when you're making public spaces, to think more about experience versus that plan diagram. Because here's some simple things. Why do we plant trees in a line down the street? Right? If you're doing a streetscape project, every tree, do 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 does that mean as humans navigating an urban grid, and even a suburban grid, we would get lost? You know? Lights, place, all the furnishings, we organize them in a way. Most people don't experience them that way. Most people, when they're moving through the environment, you're experiencing things in relationship to one another. And this idea for me is, we're working on a project in downtown Berkeley right now. Um, I want to make a street that literally is an enmeshed experience, where as you're moving through the environment, 
It's not about conforming, right? Uniformity. You know, one guy once told me, it's like, I was presenting a plan, he goes, you have 10 trees on that side, why do you have only five on the other side? And I went, it's shady over there and sunny over there. But he was from Public Works. And the idea that I would do five on one side and 10 on another didn't make any sense. This throws the whole thing up in the air. I'm not even going to give you the chance to count one side to the other, but just filling the space between the two. Because when you look at landscape, not at that local level, but at this larger level, there are all kinds of relationships we can make that we make subliminally in our mind. And that somehow, as we move in as designers to the local and even to the site level, we can begin to reference those things. And to me, that's when landscape becomes revelatory. Landscape becomes a way then to talk about those larger beings. That just because I'm along the street here doesn't mean I have to act differently than not being along a street over here. And we can look at systems, which we're looking at, particularly we're looking at um, typologies of natural systems, particularly here, we're looking at something around in here, two and four percent, that structure begins to come through. But you can also look at other patterns, you know, wildlife patterns, which is a big thing in the East Bay now. You can drive through the East Bay and at a certain time of night, there are deer, right, that make their way all the way down to the bay now. There's raccoon, I mean, the, it's more wildlife in North Berkeley than I've ever seen. And it's kind of scary. <laughs> um, but this idea that those patterns are actually increasing along with these patterns, and these are people, uh, that we can begin to sort of understand those relationships. And at the end of the day, maybe we can have a landscape that looks completely different than we ever imagined. A landscape that's constantly changing. A landscape that's not beholding to that figured ground. Thank you so much. Uh, Walter, thank you very much. Uh, Meg is having some troubles getting around with, uh, with her legs, so I'll, I'll be happy to field any uh, questions that you might have for Walter. Does anybody have a question? They're good students. No. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no and yes. Um, I mean, like any one studying, I was just, when I was in architecture school, I tried to look at everything. When I was in landscape school, I just looked at everything. And, you know, when I was in school, you copied. I mean, really, I mean, the first project in architecture school was um, you basically took a building and you made a building based on that building. I mean, you basically copied. And it got to a point, though, where there are some people that I'm more interested in than others. Uh, but, but one of the things that I'm constantly looking for in the work is after a project is done, if it doesn't look strange to me, something's not working. And what I mean by that is every project that I work on, I want to walk away there's something kind of idiosyncratic, you know? Something kind of out of place. Because most corporatized landscapes, they all look the same. And the more you start reading landscapes, you can kind of see that detail that gets done over and over and over again. You know, like the detail that I'm like fond of these days is lawn, narrow DG strip, right? So everything gets cleaned up around the edges. But I'm always looking for the strangeness in it all. Um, and so, and those things, they, they come through process. It's not an aesthetic thing. It come through, you know, getting to a point where you can ask more questions. Oh, yes.
<laughs> I'm only showing two projects. No, um, that's a good question. If you guys didn't hear, you know, the relationships of working with architects. I mean, I would have to say being trained as an architect helps because one, when I'm designing, there is no sort of chip. You know, there is very little subserviency. We're speaking the same language. But on the other hand, uh, I'm trying to get to a position in my studio where I'm not hired by the architect. Where did he go? He ran away. Oh, okay. Um, because I find you know, increasingly that architects want to control everything. You know, like the landscape is an extension of the building. You know, and I've had architects tell me, you know, let's move that on the south side of a building. Your tree is in the way of my elevation. And this is in an area where shadow needs to hit that building. Um, but I just find, you know, that I'm at a point where I don't, you know, there are some people that I work well with because we respect each other's ideas. And that's the relationships that I'm interested in. I'm not interested anymore of trying to change the way people see the world and work. Uh, and, you know, if you've ever practiced landscape architecture, you know what I mean. Landscape architecture, landscape is the last thing in. It uh, has the, one of the lowest budgets on most building programs. And it's the first thing cut. You know, it just behooves me if you can have a, let's say, $500 million building and a $10 million landscape, right? And then you end up being $100 million over and you want to take $2 million from the landscape. You know, to me it seems like you would take it out of the building, you know? And, and I'm just saying this, you know, because that's just an equitable distribution. I think we have to argue. You have to argue for certain things, that it's not about just being aesthetic, but it's about being structural. And what we're finding now, sustainable-wise, that a lot of the stuff in the landscape matters. You know, the stuff you don't see and the stuff you don't, you'll never see underneath. But I think, you know, it's just really hard. Uh, but I think it's always, well, in the last hundred years, historically, there's been this subservience, and I think some people do it better than others. Yes, Meg. I'm fascinated to hear that you're doing this MFA um, in, in sculpture at the University of Chicago, and I'm wondering if you can tell us how you think it's going to influence your work. I don't think it's going to rephrase that. It has already influenced my work. I've been working, and I didn't show any projects today from it. The last five years we've been working in Charleston, South Carolina with Spoleto. It's an art festival that, that runs every year. And Mary Jane Jacobs out of the Art Institute, um, she invited four artists to come down and work with her. And she didn't know what she wanted to do. And it ended up being a speculative type of installation. The first year we grew an acre and a half of rice in a school courtyard to remind people of them being in a wetland. Uh, the second year we took on a 500 acre Friedman's community uh, that was experienced development. So we were working together, and then they had this idea of a distinguished master of fine arts that they wanted people who were interested in examining their public practice to come to the Art Institute and use them as a resource, and in turn, they could use us as a resource. And, and what it's allowed me to do is really think more about landscape, think more about how landscape can be much more uh, instrumental uh, in people's lives, and particularly the public realm. And I think that's one of the things that I'm fascinated by, how much money we spend in the public realm and how much we get out of it. We get nothing out of it. You know, road construction, streetscape, it's expensive stuff. You know, burying, just putting things underground. It's like a million bucks, like a block. I mean, it's crazy, these numbers. And we get nothing out of it. So for me, it's how can I, just with these simple elements, make something quite beautiful. Um, and so I've been looking at, you know, how can you make curving gutter this beautiful thing? Uh, we're doing a couple of projects now where we have um, a, a gateway into a, a, a project that's like at 33% and they needed a median. And we actually took curving gutter and wrapped it as tight as possible. And it actually created a thumbprint.
for the community, but it also became this drainage piece that you could actually see. So again, taking these things that we're already investing our money in and elevating them. So it made me be much more strategic about some of these things. Yes, sir. I can't hear you. No, um, I just heard uh, we're doing a project for the students, actually, of UT Austin. Um, and the students at University of Texas, Austin, they floated their own bond to build their own community student center, which is pretty progressive, right? They tax themselves, right? At least the ones who are there today won't be there tomorrow, but, um, <laughs> but they're building their own um, student center. And part of that, there was an old parking lot Right, that this new facility is going over. And the kids there are really into sustainable practices. And so what we're suggesting is to basically take the existing curb and gutter and we're cutting it and basically making large cisterns and fountains out of them. And so the, they'll literally stack up like precast pieces and you'll be able to like inhabit them. But that became part of the selling point. But again, that acuteness and looking at you know, ways in which to make the landscape come alive, I think is is the powerful aspect. Yes. Yes, sir. What would you say, in your mind, were the most successful aspects of Lafayette Park? It be, it's still being there today. It's, no, really. It has very little to be with the design. These were, you know, for no, people have called them homeless people or transients, and they're black males. Right? And in most places, these people don't exist in the public realm. And for them to still be there 10, 12 years later in a place that's public, I think that's way far better than any formal move or anything. Um, but I think it instilled in them that someone was willing to invest in them, and therefore, they're still there. So I would say that is what it would be. Yes? I just have, want to digress a little bit on the point of working with architects. Um, I'm curious to know, and you know, we get into a lot of you know, words in this college about the distinction of landscape architecture and architecture in the two departments, but I'd like to kind of hear from you, well, first of all, what can landscape architects, what can architects learn from landscape architects? And what is, I mean, I, I notice a lot of aspects to your project that to my mind as an architect is architectural. And so I thought maybe, you know, you could, you could kind of speak to that, the kind of blurred distinction yeah, of the yeah. two professions or, or just the simple question of, of, of landscape architecture and architecture and, and how could we learn from each other? Well, um, God, you're going to get me in trouble here. But I'll just speak my, I'm, I'm in, in Indiana, so I can talk. Um, I think landscape architects, we could be much more rigorous, right, about how we articulate and think about what it is we do. We should control our medium. We don't do, I don't think we do it as well as we should. And what I mean by that is we should, we should know what it is we do, and we should somehow be very articulate about what that is. And so again, a lot of these questions I'm posing today, you know, we should be questioning why we work a certain way. We should be questioning why we treat things a certain way. So when I walked through your studio today and someone was showing me um, a community center, uh, a pedestrian trail, you know, it's all become this very homogeneous stuff. You know, and it's, 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 it's kind of tight without substance. So that's one thing. I mean, I, I really do. And, I, and I'm constantly pushing my students to try to articulate what it is. What are those core things that you're trying to do? The vocabulary, the way you draw it, the way you make it. You know, that it's, it's not all kind of just fuzzy, right? Kind of just green. But I can draw it. Sections, you know, we never in my studio. If you're doing a section in my studio, it's never any smaller than an eighth of an inch. If you do a 1 to 50 section, you're not seeing anything. 
If you're doing one eighth, you can actually show every little thing. So I mean, that's so that's one side. The other thing with architects, I just think architects need to learn about the ground. They need to learn about process. You know, they need to sort of learn that, you know, it's hard keeping that stuff at bay. <laughs> and that's what architecture does. It stops that stuff, you know, and it's hard to do that because you're investing a lot. And I think landscape is the opposite, right? You know, we, we want it to be open, but we're doing the same thing. We just don't know it. You know, someone said, you know, architecture, landscape, or architecture is, you know, it's slowing down nature or it's holding nature back. And in a way, we both want it to come through. And I think it's through this marriage, through this conversation, that we figure that out the best way. You know, I think we're both holding it back, and we're not doing a really good job about it. And one thinks it is, and one, you know. So, but I think a little bit more of this. And lastly, you're in a school here, right, of architects and landscape architects. Every time someone puts a drawing up on the wall, I don't care who you are, Sight should be there, right? I mean, you should learn from one another. You're right here. It's not like you got to like run across to a snowstorm to see someone else. But you know, you should be sharing things. And I think some schools do it better than others. RISD is very good at it. UVA very good at it. You know, where they're in quarters, it's not that they're teaching it. It's just osmosis. You know, I'm here. God, look at those architects doing that. I'm going to try this. Look at those landscape architects. I'm going to try that. And faculty should encourage, right? And I think that's the only way. Um, you know, 1970s, that's when all these schools were started, the colleges of environmental design. And we do it worse than others. I mean, I teach at Berkeley, and I will tell you, you know, it's hard. I wanted to occupy, with my landscape students, one of the architectural floors. Oh, my God. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.